We'll be starting in Second Chronicles, chapter 32. Second Chronicles, chapter 32. If you want to be turning there. This should finish our consideration of Hezekiah, the king of Judah, who received an extra 15 years to live, which is uh, an interesting proposition. But we're using chronicles because the chronicler, uh, as in the, the writing there, which is, of course, inspired by the Holy Spirit, but the chronicler is uh, always capturing the spiritual analysis and weighing in on what happened, why that happened, giving, you, giving us an understanding that we need. And uh, maybe you would even call this application of the Scripture. So we're looking at the spiritual analysis of Hezekiah's extra 15 years, which fits into our larger theme that we are created in him for good works which God prepared beforehand for us to walk in, according to, according to Ephesians 2. But the record shows in Second Chronicles, come on, there you go. The record shows in Second Chronicles 32, that Hezekiah, at verse 25 specifically, did not repay according to the favor shown him. He did not make a return according to the benefit done to him, we're saying. So, unfortunately, though he had been ill, and it was a mortal illness, and he prayed God asking that this might be taken away and he might be spared, and he was. God listened to him and worked a miracle even to confirm that Hezekiah would have an additional 15 years to live. He got, you know, he went from you will die of this illness to I'll give you another 15 years to live. A lease on life, if you will. But the scripture analyzes this by saying he made no return commensurate with the benefit. He received um, a lot of good in the sense that he received um, extra life, he received extra time, but he didn't make good on it. It was, of not, it was not a benefit. It didn't help him. It didn't help, if you will, the cause of the Lord. And that's a bad place to be. So we want to look at the spiritual analysis of this thing and try to figure out what is this? Uh, how did this come about? How do you avoid this, if you will? But we'll go over to Isaiah 39 because this also has information that we need. One thing that you find, Isaiah 39, the, the, the prophet captures um, a visit from envoys of Babylon to Judah. This is well before Babylon will become a threat to Judah to carry them into captivity, but they are going to do that. And um, this is one of the things that happens during Hezekiah's extra 15 years that he's given to live. He's visited by envoys from Babylon. And if we look at this with the eye of the chronicler, understanding that Hezekiah failed to make return, then we can understand why what has been recorded has been recorded. So the first two verses say, At that time Merodach Baladan, son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent letters and a present to Hezekiah because he heard that Hezekiah had been sick and had recovered. And Hezekiah was pleased with them, that is to say, the envoy, the messengers, and showed them the house of his treasures, the silver and gold, the spices and precious ointment, all of his armory, all that was found among his treasures. There was nothing in his house or in all his dominion that Hezekiah did not show them. What is that? Well, 
It's an opportunity. The king of Babylon, it says at verse 1, reached out to Hezekiah in the first place because he heard that he had been sick and had recovered. Well, how did Hezekiah recover? Well, it was the Lord God of Israel. And how was this confirmed? It was a miracle. This man was sick to death. He was going to die, and God performed a miracle to confirm that he was given an extra 15 years to live. The power of that 15 years, you know, and of the timing of that would be such that this is a chance to teach the king of Babylon something about the Lord God of Israel, isn't it? He heard that God had healed him, so he sent him a letter, you know, reached out. That's a chance to teach the king of Babylon something about the Lord, which is exactly what Hezekiah did not do. He did not do that. It says there was nothing in anywhere, in his house, in the temple, in his all of his dominion, everything that he had power over, there was nothing he did not show them. He showed them everything. Meaning that he shared everything that belonged to the Lord with people who don't know the Lord and didn't even take the opportunity to teach them about the Lord. That is called squandering. That's a wasted opportunity. He squandered it. Had a chance to do something here. Maybe would have made a difference in the fate of, his, of uh, Judah. Why did this happen? Well, it's because um, where we were back there at Second Chronicles um, 32, verse 25, where it said he gave no return, remember? The reason was his heart was proud. His heart was proud. It was lifted up high. He, he was riding high because he'd been given 15 extra years of life. So in his pride, he shows off to Babylon, of all things. <laughs> well, the, the prophet Isaiah comes and asks him, oh, where are they from? And You know. Oh, some faraway place, you know, nowhere important, right? Fifth verse, Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house, what your fathers have accumulated until this day, shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. And they shall take away some of your sons who will descend from you, whom you will beget, they will be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. So Hezekiah said to Isaiah, the word of the Lord which you have spoken is good. For he said, at least there will be peace and truth in my days. Hmm, interesting. Yes, the word of the Lord is, days are coming. Everything in your house will be carried to Babylon. So what he has done has shown them everything that they wanted and everything they could take, which is what they did. And among the things that are going to be taken are Hezekiah's own sons, verse 7 of Isaiah 39. They will take away some of your sons who will descend from you, whom you will beget. They will become eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Which is to say, that's the end of Hezekiah. And, you know, those who were descended from him who might have continued the line will be eunuchs. There won't be any continuing lines. That's over. But remember what Hezekiah said, the word of the Lord is good because there will be peace in my days. So what we're finding out about that is that the leader, Hezekiah, 
seems to care little or nothing about the next generation. What happens to them, that's not important to him. May I submit to you that a leader who cares nothing about the next generation is no leader? That's not leadership. That isn't right. That's not his job. That's not his work. Parents and grandparents know better than this, don't they? But it's a lost generation. They're going to be destroyed because of what he has done after God gave him so much. And again, he said, the word of the Lord is good, because he thought, there will be peace and security in my days. So when he says aloud, the word of the Lord is good, well, it sounds like he agrees with the prophecy and he blesses the Lord God. But really, what he's thinking is very selfish. Peace and security in my days. As long as I am alive, these bad things won't happen, and that's kind of all I care about. I'll be gone by then. So what is that? It's a waste of 15 years is what that is. That's a waste. Why did we give it to him? He did nothing with it. Lost 15 years. And we talked about uh, last time that when you compare the works he did before his illness, reinstituting the temple and the worship of the Lord God at the temple and the sacrifices, reinstituting the Passover, reinstituting the support for the Levites and the teaching priest, those are the things he did before he got ill. After he got ill, remember? He rechanneled water into the city. He built storehouses and farms. Right, there's a big difference. One of those things, you know, one of those lists is full of important things. And one of those lists is full of just things of this world. Potentially useful, that's fine. But they're in character with what you're reading here. Peace and security in my days. Don't rock the boat. It definitely hurts the next generation when we compromise with sin, when we compromise with error, when we rely or sit back on the laurels. You know, the laurel is the crown you get when you win the race. So resting on your laurels means you, you have a crown. You know, I already won. That, that's my credibility right there instead of racing again. <laughs> Keep going. No, that was a loss. Fifteen years for nothing. Now back in Second Chronicles 32, the chronicler tells you this too. Second Chronicles 32, it says there that the character of the king was tested. And of course, the reason for recording that is so that you and I know that our character will be tested. But the reason, or the rationale given, at verse 31 was this. Regarding the ambassadors of the princes of Babylon, 2 Chronicles 32, 31. Regarding the ambassadors of the princes of Babylon, whom they sent to him to inquire about the wonder that was done in the land, God withdrew from him in order to test him, so that he might know all that was in his heart. See, even the, here in the Chronicles, it says they came to inquire about the wonder that had been done in the land. They wanted to know what this was and why. Hezekiah did not have a good answer. He could have taught them something about the Lord. If he had been busy making the most use of those 15 years that he possibly could to do even more for the Lord God, he could have told them about that. But that's not what he was doing. Don't you see? That's not what he was doing. In this matter, it says that God left him to himself. Why? To test him 
and to find out everything in his heart. Meaning, it becomes yours one day, you know. One day, you know, I mean, as we're children, we got parents around us, we got aunts and uncles, um, you know. But one day, it's yours. You have to make the choice. You have to decide what you're going to do. So there comes a time when it's up to you, and you'll be tested. And what's in the heart will be known by the fruit that is born. All right, Matthew 7. That's coming. So let's go back to Isaiah 38 now, because this makes us realize something. When Hezekiah was healed in the 38th chapter of Isaiah, there's a record of something that he had written. It's kind of like a psalm or a song, which is cool, but the fact that he's clearly proud in heart that he made no return in accord with the benefit, and that he's even thinking about peace and security in my time, in my days. That's a little selfish, even. That makes you wonder about this thing and look at it a second time. If you haven't looked at it before, well, I'm sorry, you'll have to read that on your own, but <laughs> it appears to be a psalm about death or a psalm about his impending death and recovery, but look at it with me closely. There's some things happening there that actually follow the outline that the chronicler put together. Pride, a failure to make a return, maybe even selfishness. Isaiah 38, you find verse 10, I said, in the prime of my life, I shall go to the gates of Sheol. I am deprived of the remainder of my years. And at verse 12, My lifespan is gone, taken from me like a shepherd's tent. I've cut off my life like a weaver. He cuts me off from the loom. From day until night you make an end of me. Well, on the one hand, who wants to die? Well, nobody. <laughs> and so it kind of makes sense, doesn't it? But on the other hand, death is always inconvenient, isn't it? Kind of interrupts what we were doing, what we were planning, what we thought we were going to do or say. I always think of, I always, <laughs> I don't know why. And maybe I shouldn't even mention it, but I always think of the Pink Floyd song about time because the last word, the last verse of the song is, thought I'd something more to say, and it's over. <laughs> it's very good, actually. That's, that's quite right. <laughs> thought I had something more to say. Boop. That's how life is. That's how death is. It's always inconvenient, the middle of my days, prime of my life, maybe you would think, but when is it not, when is, you know, who's going to say, oh yeah, the prime is past, you know, I'm all done, I'm washed up. No, it's always inconvenient. It always interrupts our, what we were planning. You know, the dwelling or the tent is pulled up, um, you're cut off of the loom, that means you were being weaved, you were, you were putting together some garment, but it's just, it's gone now, it didn't get finished. That's life, that's death. That's how it is. It interrupts us. And this he says, I don't know, some kind of complaint? That's the deal, buddy. <laughs> that's how it is. What do you mean? Right, the 10th verse again revisited. He said, I go to the gates of Sheol. I'm deprived of the remainder of my years.
In the 15th verse, he said something similar. What shall I say? He has spoken to me and has done it. I will walk carefully all my years in the bitterness of my soul. What kind of future is this? God just gave you 15 more years and you're going to be gated in by by the grave? You're going to walk slowly in bitterness? Really? Is that how it is, Christian friend? I got sick. I got injured. I had people been mean to me. So I'm just going to wait until I die. Don't do that. That's my future. What I have to look forward to is looking back on life in bitterness. No, thanks. (laughs) No, don't do that. All the rest of my years, really? You're going to spend all the rest of your time that God sees fit to give you looking back in bitterness, just, just ready to die. That's not how a Christian lives. That's not the power of an indestructible life in Christ Jesus. You see what's happening here? You see why he didn't do anything. You see why it scares me when we don't do anything. Right? That's what I'm scared of. Isaiah 38, 15, what shall I say? For he has spoken, and he did it too. Is it God's fault, really? Is it really that woman you gave me? (laughs) Oh, Adam, no, it's not. (laughs) That serpent tricked me. No, we did it. Whether we did it on purpose or we did it by accident, we did it. It's our fault. Don't you see? In the 17th verse, Indeed, it was for my own peace that I had great bitterness. My own welfare that made me bitter. You know... It's, you know, when when you start out (laughs) in life, that's how it is. You know, babies, Emily was just reading to me an article about, actually it had been shared by April, uh, about how children don't know how to share. Little children don't know how to share, and I guess they found out that that's not something that develops in the brain until five or six years old. So we start out pretty selfish in life, you know. But as you grow, and especially as you become a parent, as you become a leader, a Bible class teacher, a mother, a father, a grandmother, you're less concerned for your own welfare than for your your own, your family, your others, the church. Yeah, that selflessness should grow through life. So we can get to the end the way that Paul gets to the end, saying, I'm poured out as a drink offering. And yet, may no one hold it against them. That selflessness, which is, of all of it, just, uh, you know, paraphrasing what Jesus said, from the cross, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. The ultimate selflessness, right? Right? But as we grow through life, that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to reach a time when we are more selfless, not more selfish. Outwardly focused, not inwardly focused. Seventeen down to nineteen of this that Hezekiah wrote. Indeed, it was for my own peace that I had great bitterness, but you have lovingly delivered my soul from the pit of corruption, for you have cast all my sins behind your back. For Sheol cannot thank you, death cannot praise you. Those who go down to the pit cannot hope for your truth. The living, the living man, he will praise you, as I do this day. The Father will make your truth known to his children." 
except his children will become eunuchs in the palace of Babylon, and the word of the Lord is good because it won't happen to me? Yeah, I don't know about that. I don't know about that, Hezzy. That doesn't sound right to me. Sheol does not thank you. Death does not praise you. Yeah, but do I thank you? Do I praise you? How, how is my life? Am I living life? They say you should try to live before you die. <laughs> Am I giving God thanks? You know, Sheol doesn't thank you. Death doesn't praise you. That's true. But do I thank God? Do I praise God? Those who go to the pit don't hope for your faithfulness. Do I hope for God's faithfulness? That he will be true to me? That his blessings will come true in my life? Or am I going along with what he said earlier? Oh, I'm consigned to the gates of Sheol for the rest of my years. The only thing left for me is just to kick the bucket. That doesn't sound like thanking God. That doesn't sound like praising God, hoping for his faithfulness. That's not what we're supposed to be like. That's not Christian. It's not godly. Well, we have to visit Ezekiel, the other prophet, to comment upon this. The fact is, we know something about this. Certainly in retrospect, and as the chronicle the chronicler records for us, but we know something about this because we know the justice of God and how he deals with us. In Ezekiel 18, I would grab you uh, this little bit. The 24th verse, when a righteous man turns from all his sins which he has committed, keeps all my statutes, and no, I'm at the wrong one. There we go. A righteous man turns from his righteousness and commits iniquity and does according to all the abominations that the wicked man does, shall he live? All the righteousness which he has done shall not be remembered because of the unfaithfulness of which he is guilty and the sin which he has committed, because of them he shall die. When a righteous man turns from righteousness and commits iniquity and does according to all that the wicked man does. He does exactly what the wicked do. When a righteous person begins to act wickedly, does he live? He does not. He dies. The Lord says that those who are righteous can change. And if they become wicked, they are destroyed too. They die. They're lost. The righteous can be lost. And so, if you think about Hezekiah, you see a very uh, stark contrast between his works before, um, before he was healed and his works after he was healed. You can see between the lines there, even in the psalm that he composed on his healing, that there's some problems here. There's some problems. This attitude is not right. And it accords with what you saw happen. But I want to point something out that the chronicler makes clear by writing it this way. If we compare Second Chronicles 29, which is the start of Hezekiah's reign, to Second Chronicles 32, the end of his reign, there are specific elements captured in both of them that correspond to one another, and these things make it clear how the Holy Spirit analyzes this life. In 2 Chronicles 29, the first thing Hezekiah did was to reopen the temple. And he actually called the Levites and gave them a lengthy speech recorded there, oh, about verse 5, down through verse 11 of 2 Chronicles 29 gave them a lengthy speech about how they need to reestablish this, they need to do this right, 
The people have fallen away from the Lord. And specifically, in the eighth verse, he said, The wrath of the Lord fell on Judah and Jerusalem. He has given them up to trouble, to desolation, and to jeering, as you see with your eyes, because they failed to worship in the seventh verse. The wrath of the Lord came on Judah and Jerusalem, though, is what it says. So he's reminding them that because we didn't worship, because the temple was not open, we weren't making offerings. We let the lamp go out, the lamp of oil that was to burn perpetually. Therefore, the wrath of the Lord God came upon Judah and Jerusalem. And he was right. That's true. And they took this and reestablished that worship and did a great thing. But if you compare it to the 32nd chapter and the 25th verse that we have re alluded to a number of times, it says, His heart was lifted up, therefore wrath came upon him and Judah and Jerusalem. So he starts out telling the priests, wrath came on Judah and Jerusalem because we didn't worship God. And in the end, because he was proud, he incurred the wrath of the Lord on Judah and Jerusalem. The record of the Chronicles makes this very clear. You can see it's the same language. And if we go back to the 29th, the other thing that he said to the priests at that time was, you know, not only was God angry with us because we failed to worship and that we let the lamp go out, but also this is why uh, 2 Chronicles 29, verse 9, this is why our sons our daughters, our wives are in captivity. I'm sorry, this is what he's telling um, this is what he's telling them. No, this is right. We're in the right place. Sorry. Okay, yeah, right. It's because of this that our fathers have fallen by the sword and our sons and our daughters and our wives are in captivity. Because they have not been faithful in worshiping. And this is what strengthens the Levites to get in there and get busy. They're saving the people. But when you compare it to what was recorded in Isaiah that we read already, Isaiah 39 at verse 7, some of your own sons will be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. His sons are going to be taken captive. So... Because they weren't worshiping and because the worship was not in place like it was supposed to be, the temple was not open, the offerings, offerings of the temple were not being made, therefore their sons were in captivity. And this spurred them on at the start of his reign. But here at the end of his reign, when he showed these things to the Babylonian envoys and wasted that opportunity to teach them about the Lord God, the curse was, your sons will become eunuchs. They will be carried off. You can see these things are intentionally parallel. And again, what he told the priests when he reestablished the worship you know, first off, this is why the wrath of God came on us. Second off, this is why our family are in captivity. And also, he said to them in the 10th verse of Second Chronicles 29, Now it is in my heart to make a covenant with the Lord God of Israel, so that his fierce wrath may turn away from us. Hezekiah's intent was to turn away the wrath of God. 
by making a covenant with the Lord. That's what was in his heart, and he revealed that heart to the Levites, the priests. This is how he kicked off what they were about to do, reestablishing the worship, um, observing the Passover, a whole bunch of other things. But as we alluded to earlier in 2 Chronicles 32, at verse 31, when he was tested, God left him to himself so that he might know all that was in his heart. He started out saying it was in his heart to make a covenant with God to turn away his wrath. But now he has incurred wrath by being proud in heart, by making no return to God. And the Lord found out all that was in his heart. That's what's happening. And yes, that is a threat. That's what that is. That's a threat. We will be judged. We will be tested and we will be judged. If you look back at Second Chronicles 29, in closing, it occurred to me at some point to try and do some math here, like try and figure out, well, what are we talking, what time of life are we talking about here? What is this? What it comes down to is when Hezekiah was offered an additional 15 years, that was basically doubling his adult lifespan. It says there at verse 1 of 2 Chronicles 29, Hezekiah became king when he was 25, and he reigned for 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abijah, daughter of Zechariah. But he was 25 when he began to reign, and he reigned for 29 years. Well, what does it tell you? It tells you that, well, 25 plus 29 is 54. At least I think it is, depending on what month of the year. But basically, he was 54, 55 when he passed away. And when he became ill, mortally ill, and he was going to die, that would have been at age 39 or 40, which most of us would say is, is pretty early. Pretty early. Uh, in our country, we would say 54 is pretty early. Not every country is so blessed as we are. But yeah, when he first became ill and was told you were going to die, he may not have been 40 years old yet, or he may have just turned 40. And that's the end for him. So instead of leaving at age 39, he left at age 54. What it tells us is that this extra 15 years that he got doubled his reign. From 25 to about 39, that's about 15 years, because he reigned for 29, and we know that God gave him 15, so that leaves him 14, 15-ish, right? It doubled his reign. Up to that point, he had been reigning, and we saw the reestablishment of the temple, and we saw the reestablishment of the Passover. We saw him write letters to Israel who had been carried off by Babylon, but the, there were still some, and those who were left, he called them in, and some of them came and worshiped God too and joined hands with Judah, and the kingdom was united under him in serving the Lord God. He did a lot of things that were faithful and strong, that's why he gets another 15, because he did a lot of good in 15 years. But his second 15 years, they were not useful. He did not do anything useful. Oh, I guess, you know, people need storehouses. Maybe. Maybe. It's an interesting thing when you think about it. The stuff that he built, you know, a water supply, storehouses, farms and ranches to provide livestock and crops. 
Those are the things you build when you think you're going to be around for a while, don't you know? When you think you're going to have a lot of extra. That's how, that's how you do it. And it's down to what Jesus said about that, you know, the foolish man who didn't have room in his barns because his crops were so plentiful and said, oh, what will I do? He said, ah, I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones and store up crops and say, take your ease, my soul, you have many years. And God appears to him in a dream and says, this night, your soul is required of you, you fool. And now whose will all these things be? And that's what this is. When he knew that he had another 15 years, he didn't live every day to its fullest. He didn't live every day like it was his last, like it counted, like it mattered. And you think these things that don't have to be done right now, well, I'm not going to do them right now. But you know what? It's always right now. <laughs> so you'll never do them. <laughs> Yeah. Would it help if I knew how long? No, it would not help. It would probably hurt. It would probably hurt. The answer is to make the return to God today. And we ask, what will be said about my life? What will be said about my life? What have I done in, you know, since I was 25, you know? And, uh, should I be given as much time more? What will I do with that? How will it go? Will it be worthwhile? What will be said? If the chronicler gets to write about my life, what will be said? How did that go? Was there a turning point? When God invested, did God get his return? That's a lot of things to think about. But I will leave that with you because we're talking about the fact Again, we're talking about the fact that we're created in God for good works. He wants us to be working, to be doing, to be acting. Storehouses are for setting things aside and doing nothing with them. Something there is that doesn't like a storehouse. We need to think about being active for the Lord God accomplishing what God wants us to do in the time that we have to do it, which is an amount of time nobody knows. I know this. It's less than you think it is. I always remember the little kid, little girl asking the, an older elderly woman bent over, I, I overheard the conversations. He said, how long have you been alive? <laughs> and the, the woman said, oh, just a little while. Just a little while. And she said, what? Oh, it's true. It's true. <laughs> That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Today, have you obeyed the gospel of Jesus? Have you given yourself and your life and your heart to God to become a Christian? Requires acknowledging your sins and your faults, repenting in the heart, confessing Jesus to be the Christ, God is right and I am wrong, and being buried together with Jesus in baptism for forgiveness of sins in order to be raised with him now to good works and in the future to eternal life. We have water prepared to help you to obey the gospel if that is your need today. Are you a Christian who has not lived right? Repent before it is too late. Let us pray with you that you might be restored because we all need prayers. If today we can help you with the prayers of the saints, if today we can help you obey the gospel, let that need be known in the Spirit by coming to the front while together we stand and sing. <laughs>